Hello, hello. Welcome to the Global COVID-19 Policy Response Roundtable. Uh, a group of lawyers from all over the world came together during COVID-19, starting at the end of March 2020. Uh, Future Law Institute put out the call and a group of lawyers responded to this call. We are now over 200 lawyers. And when we were working together, we had moved up to 180 lawyers from every continent on this jurisdiction. And what we decided to do was take a complexity informed approach to legal system change. So welcome. And we have a few of our trailblazing lawyers here with us this morning to discuss the journey that we all went on um, over the last few months and where do we go from here with a little spotlight on Kenya. So welcome everyone. And maybe we can um, yeah, introduce uh, ourselves. We have Dinah Katema from Kenya because we are spotlighting Kenya today. So Dinah, can you introduce yourself a little bit? And That is a wonderful freezing picture over there. It <laughs> always happens in the fire, internet. Dinah. Yeah. Let's give it a second, but maybe Victor, you can actually take it off uh, just to wait for Diana to come back with us. Ah, thank you very much, Anya. Um, my name is Victor Mugambi, and I was privileged to be a contributor in the Kenyan facet at the Global COVID-19 Policy Response Project. And uh, it was a great journey to contribute uh, the legislations that were enacted by our government. I'm Dina. Um, to have collaborated with. Oh no, is that better? And this is what happens when we are live on the internet coming in from <laughs> all over the world. The network, right? yeah. Yeah, so let's, um, yeah, let's take it on the fly. Um, did, did we lose Dinah? I think she's on mute. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Yeah. Yeah, Victor. And so, yeah, we're excited to have Victor and Dinah here from the Kenyan team because, um, don't mean to sound competitive, but the Kenyan team really uh, did amazing work um, during the COVID-19 policy response. And so a little later in this segment, we're going to be putting a spotlight on Kenya. We also have an incredible team from India. And tomorrow we're going to be putting the spotlight on the Indian team and what was done. But um, yeah, Anya, you want to kick it off and share a little bit about the Global COVID-19 Policy Response Project um, and uh, where we are at today? Absolutely. Uh, I see Dina is back and I don't really want to take the word out uh, from Victor. I know that you guys have a lot to tell us um, and how we approach this whole thing is that we had so many different people from many different jurisdictions and every time we jumped on a call there was something new happening with terms of curfew or with terms of you know just what the laws are that the, the countries have been emanating due to the COVID-19 and we really were just trying to make sense out of what was happening in this legal forum. So knowing that there has been a lot of prescriptions, knowing that every country has its own system, I'm really trying to figure out what are the um, issues that have been brought to the surface by this pandemic. And um, a lot of times we were actually talking about how these issues, uh, systemic issues, or how the um, gaps within our system were actually existing far before that. And it was almost inevitable for them to become even more so visible. So one thing that we were discussing previously was that um, the entropy of the system was really here before. Um, and there are at least three major issues that have been uh, addressed in Kenya as well. Uh, one was, for example, the corruption, but really, guys, I mean, I'll, I'll give the floor to you because uh, you are there, you know best what's happening and you know how to tackle these um, issues. Um, and with regard to uh, the GCPR, where we are right now is that we have created a lot of visuals. So this all started as a, you know, just collecting all these data and really just figuring out what the policies are, diving into the policy, seeing whether it has um, a due date, whether these uh, rules are going to be applicable even after, for example, the pandemic is no longer here. Um, and we have created a wonderful Google spreadsheet, but at one point there was a lot of people working on them. So we made it collapse. <laughs> uh, it was really amazing to see that a lot of people have also been joining our three hour sprints, which were basically the marathons, if we're being very, very honest here. 
Um, and in those three hour sprints, we really just wanted to um, figure out how we can collect all these things, how lawyers can actually contribute to the data analysis and whether we can even learn uh, all these processes. And what emerged was that Sure, we, we kind of learned how to use Notion along the ways. We definitely became more fluent with Google Spreadsheets. Uh, we also had Richard Smithers helping us out uh, setting up the, the blue. Uh, we might be sharing some screen afterwards because as soon as we started with the visualization, there has been a lot of um, sort of discoveries. Not really that we have found the causation, for example, why the COVID spread in certain places far more um, and how the legal system here contributed to that spread, but there were some sort of correlations in place. So the first visualization that we have made was with the rule of law um, with regard to the mortality rate. And interestingly enough, one would have thought that where the rule of law was low, the amount of the mortality rate is going to be high. And it was the reverse that we actually observed in the reality. So the higher the rule of law, the higher the mortality rate. And as soon as we saw that, nobody actually knew how to make sense out of that. And this really drew us further away and told us, no, we have to dig deeper. We have to collect, collect even more information. And the more we've done that, the more we have actually, um, it became clear to us that these rules and how, for example, the global official gazettes are being set up, there is no coherence, none at all. Every single country is publishing their laws in you know, the processes that they have been setting up. And some of them have been opening up the global, uh, I mean, the, the official gazettes, some of them have been privatizing them, so you even have to pay, for example, for it. Um, and it's very similar to what are the, the um, curfew measures or all the rest of the measures, uh, let's say the tracking measures that countries have been implementing all around the world, right? So we have, for example, uh, Nisha Rahu from Singapore telling us that all of a sudden people are provided with devices to tracking the citizens. And in other countries, you simply have an app that people have to download. And yet in another country, you don't even have any curfew or tracking measures at all. Um, so the measures really are very, very much different. And our task was basically to figure out what influences those, dif those differences and why or how we even come to the point where there's like a huge difference between one jurisdiction and another and why there is no coherence when it comes to the legal system at all. Um, those were a couple of the questions that we were trying to address. We also have a website in place, gcpr.io. I'm going to be sharing the link with you and perhaps we can share the screen. Uh, just give me a second. And there is also a website which is publicly available to see all the data represented visually. So this um, is the global COVID policy response uh, database. We have also been gathering a lot of different um, databases from other contributors. So for example, you have numerous organizations that were uh, specifically looking into how, for example, the economic measures are being created in the time of crisis or how the privacy is being affected or how the, um, the lobby organizations were also collecting some just to see you know, uh, how, for example, the law firms can help their clients within different jurisdictions. Oxford has made an incredible database. We definitely made use of that one. Um, and then there's plenty more that are being published every single day. Um, these are all clickable. So you have the links to them and then you have the visualization here. So this is, for example, the first visualization that we made. Uh, I'm sorry we, have, we don't have Richard with us because usually he would be presenting these. So he is the creator nevertheless. What you see is that in here, you have a huge uh, correlation between the countries and then um, some of the countries are uh, basically in a higher level of uh, having the um, rule of law, for example, and you can see that the higher the rule of law, um, or that there is a very, very strong correlation between the mortality rate and uh, the rule of law. So. You want to take it over and tell us more about how the situation right now in Kenya is and what are the issues that we should be addressing and perhaps we can even focus on what are the um, intervention points that we need to identify so that we can actually take some actions on that. I think before we jump into Kenya, I just would like to, you know, then give a, a status, a report as to where we're at with the project. So um, we had over 180 lawyers working on this project over the last few months. Um, we have been able to collect over 10,000 rows 
of policy data um, covering over 196 countries. We have also incorporated several different databases. Anya was pointing out the Oxford um, University that also was collecting uh, policies within particular niche areas. And we have integrated um, these databases into the work that we have, um, which is why we have, you know, the world's largest global COVID-19 policy response database. And um, after we started mapping these policies, what we started to do was organize ourselves in what we call network communities of practice. And in those communities of practice, we would look at the policies that were taking place and come up with research ideas and proposals or areas for um, system intervention. And uh, um, the one that, if you were at the opening, we mentioned it a little bit, uh, the Network Community of Practice on International Trade and Public Procurement. We came together and wrote a paper based on what we observed, based on the research from about 14 countries uh, came together and, and gave us um, a lot of research on what was happening with the government's procurement of PPE and medical supplies during COVID-19. And based on that and the policies that we were able to map, we were able to make a proposal to the UN for new crisis model procurement provisions. And so that's kind of the work that we are doing in our network communities of practice. And we have several other network communities of practice in existence, one on the environment, which will be doing a lot of work during this summit on uh, um, system intervention points relating to ecocide, um, relating to how do we structure new types of corporations that actually give effect and recognize the rights of the earth and also the integrative law lab um, at the end of every day where we are bringing um, some of those perspectives in as well. Um, and we have a network committee of practice on human rights where uh, Kenya uh, was very instrumental in the Kenyan team that came to us was very instrumental in shaping the thinking about the issues that we had to deal with in the network community of practice relating to human rights. And um, we, we, we have some plans going forward about what we wanna do in Kenya and with the Kenyan team. Um, and But we love to now um, invite Dinah or Victor, whoever wants to take the floor first, you know, to, share on why did you become involved in this project? Why did it matter to you? And what do you see, how did it go? And what do you see as the work coming out? You know, what, what are we going to be doing going forward? Um, Dinah, you wanna see if we can hear you now? Yes, yeah. <laughs> you can? Yes, we can hear you and it's perfect. Okay. So my name is Dina Katama. I am an advocate of the Harakat of Kenya in Nairobi, based in Nairobi. And when Brian reached out so, uh, to start the, in, to join the initiative, it was all about research. That's, what, that's where we started, that we were just going to be a couple of people researching, collecting documentation. And, you know, it was, that's how we all started out. But as we got talking and as we started to discuss the issues that were arising out of our different jurisdictions, uh, we started to have an inward gaze at what happens in Kenya, what's happening in Kenya uh, against the backdrop of other countries and how they were dealing with the pandemic. And for us, a few issues really stood out, which, was, which were uh, the rule of law, um, safety and security of the people and how to and how uh, corruption had had really infiltrated the different sector, sectors of the economy and how people were now being uh, sidelined because of that and especially in the pandemic with the need for um, PPE kits and the monies that were being channeled from various uh, you know, external, external areas into Kenya and how there was no transparency about this. And so we started to discuss, and Victor, please feel free to chime in if I've forgotten anything. 
Um, and so we started to discuss and out of all that we gave, I mean, uh, all the documentation then gave rise to the issues of whether we would like to start a collaboration with uh, Future Law and later in, in time, maybe also start a Kenyan hub. So I think that that's how we got um, started with all of you. And Dinah, I mean, one of the issues that the Kenyan team raised really early on um, was this issue of police brutality and the use of excess force during um, the pandemic, using the excess powers that yes. the police had. Um, and uh, yeah, in a way, and, and that was really something that we put a focus on and you all started collecting, you know, the reports of these police brutality cases. You wanna share a little bit more about the experience of Kenya with the police during time of COVID? Diana has frozen again. So Victor, I guess you could take that. Yes, uh, sure. We had uh, various cases of uh, police brutality. And um, one particular case that I remember and was uh, very close to me was uh, the death of a young boy. I think he was about 13 years old, uh, Yasin Moyo. Um, he was shot uh, in the balcony of his house. And, uh, you know, it was a very huge tragedy and uh, it caused a, a lot of uproar uh, in the nation. So this clearly uh, shows us that there is no policing of the police in this particular nation. And um, in the midst of this crisis, uh, the depression levels actually went up, um, you know, across the nation. And uh, we didn't really see the practicality of the constitution being implemented uh, to remedy such uh, issues that arose. Uh, we also did not see uh, effective presidential address uh, on these particular issues. So that is a matter that we want to push on uh, with, the, with the human rights uh, initiative that we are going to be uh, we are going to be going ahead with the Kenyan uh, Future Law Hub. These are some of the matters that we really want to have investigated and actually uh, justice to be, um, to be sought uh, for these families that have lost, that, that have lost uh, children due to police uh, brutalities, that uh, those people that have actually sustained severe injuries because of police brutality uh, during uh, the peak of the coronavirus pandemic in Kenya. And the enforcement of the curfew order did not actually, uh, was not manifested uh, to, the proper, uh, to the proper standards that it was supposed to. Uh, and that is the problem uh, that we have uh, here in Kenya. And, uh, you know, especially taking the fact that we have ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, we really wanted to see that the implementation of these legal instruments, why do we say that they form actually part of our domestic legislation? Um, so these are some of the issues uh, on police brutality and several other uh, cases have arose in Mombasa and uh, other parts of the country. And it was quite, it was quite unfortunate. So these are some of the issues we want to address in terms of human rights. And, and thank you for that, Victor. And also you guys have been raising the issue as well about um, how- Absolutely, I think I, I would, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Dinah. Because you froze before, so please go ahead now. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, there, there, of course, in Kenya, especially, I, I know that also around the world, there's been a rise in authoritarianism and the restriction, the restrictions came, yes, to protect the masses, but there was massive human rights uh, violations. And we would like to advocate for restriction in moderation. That's what we'd be asking for. We, we understand that at times, pandemics come and, and crises generally come with the need for uh, restrictions, especially on personal um, rights, but we would like to call for restriction in moderation and done in accordance with the law. And so that's one of the issues I was going to talk about later and say that for policy, you know, once we've looked at the data, what else comes out of it would be policy to call for our policy change and, and, and policy regulation. And that's one of the things that we would like to see. We would like to see how we can structure the, the moderation of personal rights um, in a, done in a lawful manner. 
other than just in a very arbitrary manner as I think for us, the main, one of the main um, footprints that COVID-19 left for us is police brutality that went unchecked and was meted out on citizens who really did not have another way. You know, if the government was saying, come to us and we will give you food, we will give you protective clothing, we will give you one, two, three things, then, you know, you can stay home. Um, but we weren't, that wasn't happening. There was no intervention. So people were out there trying to get home on time, trying to get, but all, all this under severe police brutality. And it just, it's, I think it turned the health crisis into a brutality, police brutality crisis, which um, shouldn't have been. Right. And I mean, I think this points to, I see we have Richard and Brian here. Yay. Two people who are very instrumental in getting us to the point that we are in, in terms of the database. And we want to bring them in. But I do want to respond to what you're seeing, because what you've done is you've identified, I think, a really critical issue that we saw mapped across many different jurisdictions as we were doing our work. And that is um, the, the, the tension that exists uh, it, on the duty of a government to protect its citizens in times of a crisis like this, but also the freedom of citizens um, to be able to be and to move around and, and all of that. And with one of the correlations uh, Richard had pulled out, um, we saw that where there was a higher rule of law, and we know it's not a causation, and we want to be very careful when we see it, where there was a higher respect or whatever for rule of law in a society, there were higher mortality rates. And in more author authoritarian states um, where governments could, you know, maybe not uh, have to tiptoe around citizens' rights so much as they have to do in the West, you saw their mortality rates were lower. Not a causation, not a correlation. Just one question before we, we go to someone else with you on that. How was Kenya's mortality rate during the COVID-19 crisis while all this was going on? How have you done? Well, I don't, okay, well, every life is precious. And so I yeah. don't want to say we're doing well, <laughs> uh, but our mortality rate is low. Right now, uh, today, I haven't looked at the statistics, but you know, we have had, maybe Victor can say, D Victor, did you look at the statistics this morning? Uh, yes, thank you. I actually did. And our cases, the confirmed cases that we have in Kenya are above 43,000. And we actually totaled 805 deaths uh, since the pandemic was declared a national crisis in Kenya. And, That's uh, the statistic. and for me, I think that this, this just goes to show um, the interventions that were put in place. I cannot say if they were effective or not. What I do know is that COVID brought fear uh, for everyone generally, but more so there was fear of the law rather than fear for dear life, you know, and the sanctity of life, you know. And so I don't know if the interventions are what worked or do we just have uh, um, a low mortality level because we are not testing enough? Are we, do we know that what numbers uh what numbers we really have, because I think that we have very low testing, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing that I wanted to ask, uh, maybe Richard and Brian, because uh, this initiative has been taking place for quite a long time. It wasn't like, you know, we're going to be meeting for twice mm -hmm. uh, and then it's going to be all over. Um, it's been a couple of months and you've been with us and have been contributing to the data, what brought you here? I mean, hearing about what is happening in Kenya, but Richard, you're from UK, Brian, you're from Trinidad and Tobago. Can you address um, what was the, you know, the urge that you felt to join the collaborative and to really um, contribute to the data? Brian is from Kenya. Sorry, for Kenya, okay. But you I'm are practicing currently based in Trinidad, in Trinidad yeah. and Tobago. Yeah. Okay. Well, for me, um, I was... Yeah, Richard, go first. It's fine, Richard. Okay. Um, I was wanting to see whether the policy responses that, that governments were considering and starting to implement were actually backed by any hard evidence, whether they were, uh, whether they were fear based or evidence based. My concern was that um, 
it is very easy for people to spin into blind panic, whether that's on an individual basis or a state basis. Um, and uh, that if if the policy responses didn't actually match the the evidence that was around, um, and they weren't evenly applied, um, that there would be a lot of uh, of waste, um, economic impact, uh, and not necessarily the best um, the best impact in terms of handling uh, a pandemic of of this kind either. Uh, so joining the collective was was about trying to um, really connect uh, connect that up and using. Uh, data analytics and visualization to try to establish um, correlations, uh, not necessarily causal um, correlations, um, and also see what the shape of policy responses um, has been and at what point um, and whether it was in response to increasing mortality or just fear. That's a Thank good you. reason. I hope you got some results as well, or at least some. Um thoughts as a conclusion maybe we can address that afterwards but Brian yeah please do tell us yeah uh, on my part I um it, it was a call to action so COVID was affecting everybody across the world not just Trinidad or my country Kenya or in England whatever so we have this um pandemic affecting everybody globally and in terms of legal systems change we needed to see um effective policies coming into play in terms of procurement because uh, again my country Kenya you would get those instances of corruption in terms of when let's say the CEO of Alibaba sent things down to Kenya things got lost or the prices of masks and the PPE were just uh, being controlled by um, cartels and whatever so when uh, Margaret and Anya approached me um, to to see whether we could start recruiting lawyers from all over the world. So like this is a very beautiful challenge because this is something that's going to change the world positively. Mm -hmm. And um, what a, what's, a, what's so marvelous to me is we work with lawyers from literally all over the world, all the continents in the world in different time zones. And we met like three hours for the first few months. It was very, um, I think it was almost every other day. And then we started having our Thursday meetings and it, it really is a great success. And now if you go to the GCPR website and the whole database is there and it, it, it really goes towards a positive change all over the world. So for me, it was a feel good vibe and doing something uh, for the greater good of everybody. And, and what was incredible, Brian, is, is what you were able to do. I think you were instrumental in bringing in a many different lawyers from across East Africa. Um, yeah. Did you find it difficult, you know, getting lawyers to come on board and be a part of an, an unique project like this? Well, well not, not quite, because uh, actually, Margaret, uh, I, this, is the, this is the good thing about um, uni education and being that chatterbox in uni, because I was always that chatterbox in uni. So I, I, I managed to maintain contacts with all my legal friends. So when you tasked me, like Brian, let's find people all over the world. I'm like, oh wow, who, who do I know in Angola? Then I found my friend Mila. Who do I know in Ghana? Then I found my friend Jocelyn. Who do I know in Malaysia? Then those Shami, those everybody. Oh, who do I know in Kenya? Oh, there's Victor. So it's just by utilizing my social network and being like, I, I, I need lawyers. I need a lawyer. I need some lawyers in Africa help me, hit me up on Facebook or Instagram. And that's how it happened. And everybody proved so helpful and it all worked so well. So uh, in terms of challenge, I wouldn't say it was quite a, a major challenge because I think we were all in the same boat and not knowing what to do. And we all just really wanted to help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, when, we, when we look at what we were able to do, one of the things I think, and one of the things we're doing in this conversation is putting the spotlight on Kenya today, and we want to put the spotlight on India tomorrow. Um, one of the things I think that came out, guys, from Kenya as well, was how funds were being used, uh, funds that were given to Kenya um, from international agencies to address the COVID-19 um, pandemic within your shores. 
and there were issues there. Um, um, Dinah or Victor, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And uh, yes, sure. Yeah. Um, as I said, one of the issues for us that really came out was that we are lacking transparency. Apart, well, it wasn't uh, new to us, but uh, in the area of public procurement, this was very, very serious because then, sorry, so, um, <laughs> so, so public procurement was a major, major issue for us. Um, number one, I, I want to just give an example as Brian pointed it out. Alibaba sends uh, PPE kits to Kenya. Another country sends ICU gadgets to Kenya and beds and you know, all, all the equipment that comes to lock in uh, an ICU kit and they go missing from a, an airport, a, a huge public airport, they go missing. And then two weeks later, we have um, the who's who, these are public, you know, these are politicians, governors, um, senators, members of parliament, setting up ICU beds in their houses. Now, to my knowledge, an ICU bed and uh, ventilators and things like that are not things that I can just walk to a public market and pick up and go home with. This is specialized equipment. And so, you know, to the correlation is, I mean, it's too, it, it, it's impossible to miss it. But uh, ICU equipment is missing and you have it in your house. Why is there no transparency about where you picked it up and where our hours went? Because the Kenyan people deserve to know. So first of all, the rule of law had, was just thrown out of the window and it became the who's who should survive this pandemic and the poor people should just, you know, um, you know, pray to their lesser God, which is a very sad state of affairs because it should have been the other way around. The poor people are the ones who cannot afford healthcare, and so our healthcare systems should be should be coming in, and the government should be coming in to protect them, other than the people who can afford proper healthcare. And so, for Kenya, uh, the first thing is that there's just no rule of law, and there's no application of the law. Again, with all the restrictions that were being put in place, do not be out at this time. Do not have a hundred people in a gathering. We saw politicians go out and continue politicking with thousands of people at their rallies and nobody has been brought to book. This is a very, very terrible issue because people were in their homes with their friends or their family and they were arrested for this and put in quarantine areas. I mean, the discrepancy in how the, the law is being applied is just terrible. And I think if I could just, uh, just put some little uh, thought on that. I, I find it quite unfortunate that we're doing a pandemic, facing a pandemic uh, rather, and uh, the private institutions are turning this into a money-making venture. Because I, I think in Kenya right now, before you travel, you need to have a COVID certificate. Is that correct, Dina and Victor? Yes, yes, and absolutely. And certificates, to get them, uh, to the public institutions, it really takes a long time. So you have to resolve to go to, let's say Nairobi Hospital or Aga Khan to get the private tests done. And it's not cheap. It's, it's about, um, is it about, it's, is it around maybe 15,000 Kenya shillings, between 15,000 and 20,000 Kenya shillings, somewhere thereabouts? Well, it has come down now. Or oh, they brought uh, it down, yeah. Yeah, and uh, my aunt was in my house this morning and she's going to Ghana and it's come down and she's doing the test for about 6,000 and um, okay. she'll get her results by end of the day. So it's come down a little bit, but when we hear that Senegal has been testing for much, much less, right. then we wonder where is our government and what interventions are they doing to make sure that we get this, you know, rapid test kits, um, you know, quickly and more affordably. Right. Okay. Um, yes, I, I think I'd like to add something as well. Um, you know, when uh, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, we had received funds uh, from outside, uh, from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, we borrowed loans from the African Bank, but we did not see the proper utilization of these funds. 
And that is actually um, where the problem of misappropriation comes in. And now we have the Access to Information Act, which um, is not really being practically uh, utilized by whether it's uh, the public or legal practitioners, we're just letting these issues slide uh, underneath our palms. So these are some of the, the issues that I just wanted to share and uh, bring, to bring to light, yeah. This is incredible. I mean, the archetypes that we are having in this group alone uh, were multiplied, to be honest, uh, when we had a broader group brought together. Um, seeing all these uh, aspects, different aspects, knowing that there is a crisis that affects a lot of people. Um, and for example, just thinking about, sure, uh, there should be public procurement in place. Um, we should be having some rules that prevent uh, mismanagement of all these funding. Uh, there should be rules in place to actually provide the testing, for example, for free. We have that here, for example, the social standard in my country is pretty high. Uh, and yet you have the possibility to go and have the private testing done as well. Um, so one thing I really wanted to ask you being present on this call, where do we go from here? What are going to be our future steps? I know that our minds work in different ways. Um, some people are focusing on the, on the narratives and are really trying to make the um, actions. The other people are more um, oriented towards the data and really need to gather all the uh, patterns first to really know what the next step is going to be. But I'm really curious, uh, what do you do with the data at hand? What do you do with the information and seeing all these multiple issues popping up? Um, how do we tackle that situation? What's going to be next in the game for you? Maybe Richard, um, you can in or I yeah. would yeah. say that, okay, yeah, yeah. Richard, please yeah. go ahead. <laughs> so I think um, I think challenges like like this are um, a regular occurrence if you look at the long term of human history. Um, you know, plague and uh, and disease is is something that's that's common through uh, through every um, uh, every century. So it shouldn't really come as too much of a surprise that we have to face it. But I think what's ex exposed is our um, lack of preparation for it particularly when we live the way that we live now, which increases some of the risks, um, the way that our economies are meshed and the way that our supply chains work. Um, in, a, in circumstances like these, we're uniquely uh, positioned to fail, uh, to respond properly. Um, what's also interesting is to see how some of the preparation and the disaster and contingency planning in certain areas in the world were considerably better um, than in others. Um, it was as though a complacency had particularly grown in Europe as to the risk of something like this happening. Um, what we can also see is that even those studies had, had taken place, it wasn't as though politicians had taken them terribly seriously. Um, and a bit like some businesses, contingency plans, you can write it down, you can prepare for it, you can discuss it. But when it comes to it actually happening, all that sometimes gets thrown out of the window in favour of panic. Mm -hmm. So I think what we need to look at is how do we handle all sorts of, of potential uh, disasters and occurrences in the future uh, with a little bit more continuity, a little bit more um, uh, capacity to deal with it, uh, backup plans and also coordination between nations um, to eliminate the possibility of things like you know vaccine nationalism um, and uh, the distribution of, of medical kit to the wrong places you know the places that are not necessarily the highest priority or to pe individuals rather than uh, than organizations in the, the example that uh, that you've explained um, previously so that's my, my feeling on it it um, I think what we'll probably learn a lot is about about preparation, uh, about civic um, um, uh, relationships between the state and individuals as well, and on the communication side, which has been uh, weak. Um, it has been manipulative, I think, at times, um, and I don't think that's helped because uh, it almost feels like the boy that cried wolf uh, when the when governments try to inspire fear. Um, then people are, uh, are necessarily um, a, a little bit conscious that they may be being misled in the future. And so they won't necessarily listen to what the government is directly saying to them. Um, so I think messaging has also been a problem as well as a lack of preparation. 
um, and uneven uh, lawmaking um, and uh, and soft policy as well. So there's a lot to learn for, mm -hmm. from my um, from my view. And, and Bridget, so much, just just, mm -hmm. just before Dina uh, makes her point, I just wanted to chime into what you said. When when you look at the policies and you're looking at probably even or uneven policy making. There's a clear disparity as well when it comes to different uh, household incomes, because let's say, for example, the lockdown, the lockdown is easy, like in Kenya, the, the middle class was pushing for the lockdown. But then you have uh, the, the working class, the people in Kenya who say we say come from the Juakali industry, that means the scorched sun industry, they're out on the streets selling the, the metalware and whatever to survive, they couldn't afford a lockdown. Mm -hmm. So you see, we can all say we need to lock down, we need to social distance. But then there's some people in different strata, strata, sorry, they really can't be put in such solutions. So how are we going to get creative solutions that ap apply across the board, really? That's my observation. Yeah, and in our, in, the, in our states, we've all, certainly post-war in Europe, for, for example, uh, we've considered the needs of, um, of of looking after the the weakest in society, with uh, the needs of maintaining um, you know capital and um, uh, and business, and so I think that's part of the preparation. You know, if you're going to have circumstances like these occurring in the future, we we need to be able to look after the people who have the most to lose from it. And as 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 you say. Um, uh, people who are expected to work in a factory can't work from home it's not possible and so it adversely affects people who work in retail who work closely mm -hmm. with in in close proximity to other people you know social distancing has very very different impacts on people it uh, has much less of, of an impact on a misanthropic um, hermit uh, than it does on somebody who uh, who's working in a factory you know alongside other people and they count on that for, for, for you know for, to, to survive and their and their children and their family um, and they may not have a lot of elastic when it comes to their finances they might not be able to cope for even a couple of uh, weeks or a couple of months and if there's also restriction on being able to travel for to find work that's an additional um, uh, impact as well. We, we've heard that example in India where mm. um, people were, uh, were, were, were wanting to move from, um, from region to region for, for work and unable to do that and unable to then find work in, in, in their, their, their locality. So it does ad adversely affect uh, certain people more than others. Um, and it's a very complex picture as well. I don't think that's a, a straightforward one to map. Mm. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do. Dina, what about um, you? So I want to just pick it up from where Richard has, Richard and, and Brian have spoken of. So there was a disruption in business. You know, there was a disruption mm -hmm. for what we call the Jokali sector, as Brian has explained. There was a disruption for people who work in even offices, even lawyers. So how quickly um, our laws and our, our policies around this can turn around to to assist the, the masses to move on, then would be really quick. I mean, we need to be to, to put in place policies that are flexible, that can allow the government to support people in times of a crisis for a short time as the disruption goes on. And so I, I think that that would be one of the things we would look to. We would be looking to economically, how do we, how do we support people when their livelihoods are gone? How does this, how does, how does the, the government correlate with the people when when um, a disruption occurs for the for lawyers it it um, maybe uh, was a positive thing because now we have cases online and it's moving really quickly and you know we're coming into terms with it mm -hmm. quickly mm -hmm. and so maybe that's a good thing. Again, I want to talk about messaging um, that there, there there has to be a collaboration with every sector that's involved. In the health sector, for example, there was a time that, you know, dexamethasone, you know, uh, medication was being thrown out there that people should get this, people should get that. There should be a restriction. There should be only one voice speaking because then um, the people who are suffering from autoimmune disease were being affected because then they need these for every day. 
but people are out there now just hoarding this this medication and so the law has to come in and be able to do something um, to allow every sector to come together work together even with the messaging on all on all forums and then just as i said earlier um you know public procurement are we going to go into policy that's going to uh, make make it more transparent give it better record keeping you know, and so for me, I just say that what, what our collaborative has done for me is to, I want to be able to participate in a structured way of intervention in whichever way it is, but it should be structured and the law and lawyers and lawmakers, policymakers should be at the forefront of trying to bring all these people together so that our interventions are structured other than just everybody doing something in their own pocket. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's just being a mass of, of interventions which are That's not right. collaborative and not helpful. That's yeah. right. And mm -hmm. it, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. that's exactly what it, it's about, Diana. I'm looking at the time. And, oh, and I yeah. do want to hear a few words from Victor, at least uh, closing mm -hmm. words before we go. But I would like to invite everyone to join us throughout the day in the collaborative journey. Every, every time you see an orange button, on the schedule because that's where we'll be able to go deeper we spend the mm. time to talk about these issues and identify the roadmap for ourselves going forward but victor any final um words because we want to keep it really tight <laughs> yeah i just i just want to be brief um you know at the end of the day as we had earlier discussed in our in our collaborative uh program i think at the end of the day it's all about the objective is radical system change and I want to go back to the five L's that you actually uh, introduced to us, which is lobbying, legislating, learning, leveraging, and litigating. So that is the wow. only way that we can actually have these things uh, effectively come out uh, in our society and also uh, having a transparent uh, judiciary system that is able to dispense justice without fear or favor. Yay. That is the way that we're going to have this thing propel. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That was so yeah. amazing. Transformative yeah. justice. There you go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anya, you close it up? Oh, um, I mean, I can't wait for us to open up the NCOP calls again. Uh, let's have three hour yeah. sprints as soon as we're finished with the summit. Um, I think that this is going to be a huge part of the collaborative, and I'm looking forward to actually continue our talks because this has been inspiring. It provides a lot of insights, and we kind of need to talk to each other a bit more often. So let's schedule that up. Yeah, and thank you to the Kenyan team. I've been so proud of you. It's been a real privilege meeting all of you and working with all of you. And Richard has been a pure, uh, you know, inspiration throughout guiding us in the development of this database, which is freely available to all people. So you can go on our website and you can access the database and you can search the policies. And we are going to have to do a, some updating of that database after the summit because the last couple of months we've been kind of focused on this summit but um thank you everyone for tuning in this has been a first sort of uh, preview or introduction to the work that we've been doing and spotlighting kenya in particular in this hour and now we um yeah we move into our next session so yeah. thank you guys for plugging in today and sharing thanks thank you And please stay on a call. Uh, we're having the matters. We're having Scott Walker and Ben. Um, please welcome on the stage. Good morning. Ben, are you wearing? Did I pronounce it correctly? It's good enough, near enough. <laughs> so hold on, hold on. So, oh, I thought we were actually going to just break and then come back, but we're flowing right in. Why not? You want to take a break? Uh, we can go ahead. We just need to square, share screen. Um, okay. To, uh... All right. All right. If we're moving right in, let me just speak. Yeah, just technical issues, guys. We're thinking about the editing and all of that after to cut it. But yeah, we can move forward, as we said. Um, yeah, welcome to the session. I'm really honored to introduce Scott Walker and Ben Manwaring, who are the founders of Matter Innovation. And 
what I would say, and I, I hope you all can do some introduction of yourselves as well, um, Scott, as I hand over to you. But what I would say is this, what Future Law Institute is attempting to do um, in the world, <laughs> we haven't seen it being done before. Um, it's, it's something that it's a journey fraught with uncertainty and uh, complexity that we don't have all the answers to. Um, we know that we'll make mistakes, but we are committed to taking action. And we have partnered with the Matter Innovation Consulting firm that uh, consults and helps governments all over the world with uh, their public sector innovation programs and strategies. Um, and also, I mean, Ben comes from, you know, leading innovation in uh, some of the biggest tech companies in the world. And I hope that you all will share a little bit about yourselves as you do your session, Scott and Ben. But um, this, is, this, is the, this is one of our key partners going forward, Matter Innovation, to help us build our network communities of practice and the interventions, the legal system change interventions, we want to be able to catalyze support and enable lawyers all over the world to do. So without further ado, thank you and welcome Scott and Ben to the Future Law Virtual Summit and over to you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us indeed. Thank you, Margaret. Um, appreciate the introduction. Um, as has been mentioned, my name is Ben Mannering. I am the founder of uh, Matter Innovation. Just as by way of a very brief introduction, I have 20 years experience of delivering innovation in some of the most challenging environments uh, known to man, the commercial world. I've worked on glamorous stuff like toilet cleaners, and I've worked on boring stuff like governments and uh, tech giants like Google. Um, and my role primarily throughout that is to deliver change, uh, powerful, impactful change that has material value in commercial terms, in terms of turnover and profit, profitability and in the public realm to really create better circumstances for citizens. Um, and we're going to give you a very short presentation around um, the concept of disorder and disruption, primarily disruption and um, how change can have a positive effect through um, being disrupted. So I'm going to share screen, um, have a small presentation. Let's see if I can make this work for everybody. One second. Let's try that. Can you see that screen? Yes. Yes, That's we can. It. Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay. So um, the title of our, our, of our presentation is Bringing Law to Dis into Disorder the transformative power of positive disruption in making things better. Um, Scott and I will, will double hand this. Um, and if I may ask, if you have any questions, please do hold off until the end of this presentation. It's about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and we have a Q&A opportunity at the end. We're very happy to take any questions and field those um, at that point. Um, there are four sections to uh, what we're going to talk about. The first thing we're going to talk about is um, the principles of disruption and why that works. So the first question is why would you disrupt? What's the reason for doing that? I'm going to show you two, um, two visual charts here. The first one, these are the world's most valuable brands from the year 2020, uh, the, sorry, the year 2000. Um, the more astute or the more observer, observant amongst you might notice a number of these brands no longer exist. Um, there have been some controversies around number 27, for instance, Xerox, um, that's no longer around. Um, I, think, uh, I think we all know why. Um, the, interesting, the interesting chart about this actually is looking at the next one, which is today's chart. And you'll see there's a very different makeup here. So the interesting fact in this is that if you look at things like number six, Alibaba, uh, if you look at number 18, Mutai, which is a, a, a Chinese um, liquor producer, uh, Xfinity is a, is, a, is a global communications company that's built on the internet, internet platform. A lot of these businesses didn't exist 20 years ago, yet they are already in the 20 most valuable business or 30 most valuable businesses on earth. And the important part about this is why do you disrupt? Because there are clearly new opportunities in the market and the, the long established traditional things never actually stay the same. Things are always radically changing. In commercial world particularly, we see things like Amazon that was a tiny bookseller 20 years ago becoming the most valuable business on earth with, uh, with huge market capitalization. So disruption is happening in every category. And if you think you're not being disrupted, there is a, there's a bit of a shock coming because if you're not disrupting somebody, you are being disrupted yourself. So um, the critical part about this is that change is a pace, it comes at a pace. It is important for people to embrace change. But often um, we ask 
people what they want to see and what they want to ha see happen in the future. And this is often the wrong, uh, the wrong question asked to the wrong people. There's a, a very famous quote from a, uh, an industrialist named Henry Ford, um, who said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Now, he didn't give them a faster horse. He revolutionized um, two categories. He revolutionized public transportation and he revolutionized uh, industrial manufacturing by disrupting both of those, those particular phenomenon. Um, the important part here is to not give people what they ask for, but give them what they never dreamed was possible. And these are, again, disruptive, positive intentions that have allowed the world to make dramatic improvements in industrialization, in, in global access to movement, um, in transportation. And all of these things have come around because taking a disruptive view of the world and taking a strident uh, perspective, rather than listening to the, uh, the desires and the wants and the needs, those sort of very narrow horizon uh, express needs that people think they want to do in the future. As I said, um, it's important to disrupt because if you don't, uh, you are likely to, being, uh, to be being disrupted yourself. Um, it's often the case of, I ask this of my clients uh, and they, they say, oh, well, no one's disrupting us. And we'll say, okay, um, you might want to sit down for a moment. Um, I worked, had a very interesting conversation many years ago when I was uh, at a client in the music industry. I had a very interesting conversation um, on a speakerphone, not unlike this circumstance, with uh, a guy called Steve Jobs, who ran a small computer company out in California. Um, interestingly, he, uh, with a number of expletives, he told the record industry execs that I was sitting with that they were out of business. And they laughed at him. They said, what is he talking about? He runs a computer company. Lo and behold, um, EMI no longer really has any kind of real substantial standing in the marketplace. And Apple is, again, one of the biggest companies on earth. And a significant proportion of their income is derived from the music category. They decided that they would positively disrupt everything about that with hardware, with software, with service. And, uh, and they, um, they took advantage of their rivals' complacency in, in their belief and their regard that they were going to be disrupted by a small computer company that had nothing to do with music. So importantly, the lessons here are that um, whilst uh, things remain stable and consistent from a day-to-day -day basis, often these, these, these challenges and these threats might come from unexpected sources and outside influences. Um, and we need to be cognizant that there are real and existential threats available to us, but we can also be an existential threat to ourselves and, and try to challenge ourselves to improve. There's a key part around um, how and why disruption works. Um, this is a, this is a, a very advanced um, internal combustion engine um, from Mercedes-Benz. Now, we're reaching a point here that you can only value engineer. In other words, you can only make these refinements and incremental improvements up to a point. There is a limit, there's a ceiling to how far you can improve through incremental, uh, incremental um, additional value engineering. You get to a point where there is, there is no more headroom. So you need to find a different way. And the best way to do that is to disrupt. Tesla uh, come along and said the internal combustion engine no longer is really relevant to us in the future. Fossil fuels are no longer part of our agenda in the world um, in the next 100 years. There has to be a better way. Fascinatingly, they've taken a market cap of 93 billion in a very short order. I mean, they've been, again, in existence for under, under 12 years as, an, as a going concern and are currently larger than the two biggest US car manufacturers uh, in terms of volume combined. Um, I think Ford's GM, uh, market cap's around 45 billion and GM's is about 33. It's a real stark example of, again, complacency in, in markets and in, and in businesses that have been well established over 100 years. Um, and these new upstarts are taking a very different perspective. Um, what's this got to do with law, you might ask? I'm going to hand it over to you, to Scott, uh, who's going to make a point about um, a change resistance sector. Yes, well, we all know, and I'm sure it's going to be voiced many times over the course of your five days, that the legal sector is incredibly slow to change. And there's reasons, as you know, why that precedent dictates. We know that legislation is often a very slow process from the kind of political intent and will from a white paper all the way through to bring it into um, parliament. And regulation would always lag behind technology. That's why we hear the kind of ex ante, ex post, how should we deal with this type of thing? But we no doubt that uh, technology disrupts the law more often than the other way around. Um, and ultimately, you know, in order to change the ways that these things happen, you need to disrupt the system. And if we continue to rely on the same forces and the same actors, unfortunately, you know, those things which have left us where we are 
we will end up in pretty much the same sort of place. And so what is really required from a systemic or systems perspective is to think uh, much more holistically about um, how to do this in a very, very different way, uh, which requires a new mindset. And, um, you know, we'd like to introduce some of those principles about how can we and the knowledge we bring from both the public and, and commercial sector introduce those into the legal policy systems world so we start to roadmap and uh, think a bit differently about the architecture we want in the future. Thank you, Scott. So one of the critical parts and components of, of introducing a, a disruptive um, approach to, to any system, any, any sector, any market is the value of lateral input. Um, often, as, as Scott has mentioned, if you do the same things in the same way, you're going to end up with the same results. So there are a number of things that you can do from a, a lateral perspective that allow you to make these perceptual leaps into, into different ways. Uh, the first is um, really to be bold, and bold is, is crucial in disruption because what you're essentially doing is asking people to do things that are, are unforeseen, unprecedented, and uncharted. So that is a bold, uh, a bold decision to, to make. You need to be brave in order to do that. Um, you need radical thinkers who are un unencumbered by traditional constraints, the traditional rules or patterns of behavior, perceptions, and even cultural norms that, that typify a system or a, or, a, or a sector or a market. So the first rule is around being bold and being brave. Secondly, it's the ability to see around corners. It's often the case that when we work very closely in a sector that we become myopic um, to some of the challenges that, that are, are pretty much staring us in the face. You know, we're too close to the action day to day from a tactical perspective to really understand or to, to, to see or have a perspective around um, what would be required to change the game strategically. So by bringing lateral thinkers into the, into the consideration set, it's, it gives you that ability to see around corners, to see through blind spots. Third is about being comfortable with the unfamiliar. Um, there are conservative sectors, and I think the legal sector is one such, for, for uh, very, um, for very uh, probity, pro, uh, very probity based reasons that, um, that, that they are conservative. Law is, engineering is, they default to safe solutions. In law's case, obviously, it's defaulting back to case and to precedent. In engineering, it's about minimum tolerance and standards. Um, disruptors operate actually at the edges of possibility and beyond them. They break the laws, they break the rules, they break the, uh, the confines and the considerations. And it's only by breaking those constraints within categories that we can understand what can be the new possible. So having a comfort with uncertainty is critical too. And then there's the value of unintended consequences. Now, um, these, uh, these sticky notes here are very famous and, and I think everyone in the world uses them on pretty much uh, a daily basis in offices, um, but they came about through a happy accident. Now, the, 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 the material scientists at uh, 3M wanted to create a, um, a reusable adhesive and they found uh, that they, were, um, they weren't getting the kind of result they wanted. However, they could find that they had this application that if they stuck it onto notes, they could reposition notes on, on surfaces. The way that this happens is you can only introduce these, these serendipitous moments of happy, fortuitous accident if you have um, the right conditions for conditionality that allow you to have these uh, unintended consequence moments. So I was going to tell you again, um, from a cognitive dissonance point of view, how that is welcomed and how we could welcome that into the legal sector. Well, cognitive dissonance is, you know, what we're talking about here is the ability to um, disagree and see different perspectives in order to have that type of clash. So one is informed in a different way. We lawyers are um, very good at arguing, um, but we're not talking about um, just um, having a discussion and, and moot points of law. Actually, what we're thinking here is around how do we include differences and diversity of thinking. Um, unfortunately, the legal profession is quite homogenous. You know, I remember when I was at law school in my mid twenties going at, um, at night school, um, it was a lot of the same, same, um, same types of individuals, well, um, you know, similar types of backgrounds. And actually, I remember looking in the room thinking, actually, there is a very limited diversity, uh, just in the individuals, but also everyone is channeled in to be able to think in a certain way, in order to read the law in a certain way, in order to um, have a very formulaic way of answering questions. And that's problematic in the law sector because you've got this kind of contradiction here that 
ultimately, if you um, structured purposely to limit the diversity of thought because of the principles of what is ratio descendi, i.e. that the uh, case law dictates, then you're increasingly allowing people to follow into a certain structured pattern and a way of thinking, and that actually limits the ability to go to, as Ben says, go towards the edges, go to where it's uncomfortable, go to those different places where the actual innovation occurs. So you've got this contradiction. The law system not only has diversity of individuals often, but also this, you know, not able to embrace adequately a diversity of thought and perspective. And I think that it's really, really important in looking at the challenges we have to introduce new ways of critically thinking about challenges, fresh inputs, those that do challenge the status quo in different ways. Being unconventional is absolutely necessary. But here we see the legal profession that ultimately, if you start to bend, um, you know, if you, you break the law, you go to jail or you get fined, but actually how do you push it back against the law or public policy aims in very different ways to get different and also unexpected results? And I think if we are allowing convention and precedent to continue to be the path we follow on, we can only expect that we'll end up in a pretty similar destination. And unfortunately, we need to head in a very, very different path. So something needs to change. Uh, we need to forge a new direction and actually work out what is a brighter path ahead. Thank you, Scott. Um, so that's the theory. There's some, there's some introduction um, points around some of the, the, the principles and the, the, the reasons why we need to do this. Um, we have some practical experience of this. So I thought it's a very quick, um, a quick expose of some of the uh, the examples that we've, we have worked on internationally around um, disruptive innovation approaches that have made a difference. Um, the first one is uh, a, a, another small company out of California that, that has a tech um, angle to them. They're, called, they're now called Alphabet, but they were Google when we worked with them. We spent eight years working with Google, um, helping them to shift their culture in order to change the game. Now, when we started working with Google, which is well over 10 years ago, <clears throat> they were primarily a search organization and words, you know, the internet search uh, engine effectively um, and they had incredibly talented siloed engineers that had a you know, very very narrow band specialism um, it was our job and our role to break the shackles and the confines of these silos and get people to look above the parapet and see adjacencies and say we've got other skills that this could be applied to um, so through developing a curriculum of innovation and applied creativity uh, over eight years um, the, the work we did with Google stimulated the development of real transformational change for that organization and allowed them to, to introduce products like, um, like Street View, like Google Earth, uh, like uh, Gmail, for instance, which obviously was a part of their, their cornerstone of getting embedded base across a huge number of people across the earth. Uh, and even some of these more moonshot based um, activities. This, this image is actually of um, Project Loon, which is a geostable uh, balloon in the high atmosphere, which relays um, satellite internet to remote places on Earth that otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't have access to the internet because there's no way to reach it with fixed line infrastructure. So we've helped that organization transform themselves in a small way. We helped them um, to transform themselves into this huge global powerhouse that, that's really advanced and leading technology. So it's capable, you know, it, is, it is something that can work whether you're a new, a new entrant or whether you're well established. The second one um, is in the public realm. This is um, with the Dubai government. Uh, we helped um, a very conservative organization amongst their, one of their agencies, which looked after the, um, effectively the global um, business travel community in Dubai. Um, if you may, if you have spent any time in Dubai, you'd know that tourism is a very, very important um, market for them. Uh, the business tourism, business travel is very, very critical too. Um, we helped transform Dubai's um, Dubai's offer in that regard by making them more customer driven, helping them to, uh, to deflect and to compete against non-traditional rivals. So out, outside entrants coming in, commercial businesses coming in and taking um, share of exhibition space, um, taking share of meetings and incentives in hotels and so on. So these non these, these emergent threat of non-traditional rivals help them really transform from being in a position of, of hegemonic power and, and of, of market dominance to being in a much more competitive situation. The third one, um, we helped uh, a 
a tobacco business in the US moved from being an agricultural business, now they are, you know, well established, well over 100 years, they make cigarettes out of leaves and paper and you burn them. That's a very traditional, ag vertically integrated agricultural business. Um, now, through legislative, legislative pressure, through, um, through societal issues, through cultural change, smoking is dropping off. Um, and we help them to transition and transform their organization to a digitally enabled product set, a digitally enabled mindset, and to create a market leading product and, uh, and, um, and a new way of, consi of considering a, a tobacco product which didn't have the harm and the impact that it otherwise would. And this was a, a 500 million pound, uh, sorry, 500 million dollar per annum brand within two years of launch, a seven year journey, but uh, a half a billion dollars of return in terms of that transformation journey. Scott, you want to take this one? Yeah, go on. Um, so the final um, example is we worked in South Africa with both South Africa and the UK government. We won a uh, procurement contract. And what's for us the most interesting part is when we got to uh, in country, as it were, we realized that what we put forward was the wrong plans. And so we then ripped up those plans in order to forge a new, very different direction based on the situation we found ourselves in. And actually be able to realize that instead of going down a procurement tick box exercise just to do a project, by being brave and bolder, being much more disruptive, we forced other partners to come on board and do things in very different ways. I do remember the uh, most senior government official in the British government pointing a finger at me and, uh, and Ben saying, you guys are dangerous. And he thought he was telling us off, but actually he was giving us the biggest compliment we could ask for. Absolutely. So quickly, um, so how can this be applied into the legal sector? Scott, I'm gonna hand you back again to, uh, to talk through this point. So look, most boards are review and concur, but I think in these very uncertain times we have, there is no roadmap, uncertainty dictates we have to do things in um, new and different ways. Um, we would like to introduce the principle of a disruption board, which is very different to what a traditional board would do in function. So most of those original uh, boards are very much, we say, reactive conversations. They look inwards from an organizational perspective to solve immediate challenges. They are biased towards consensus and concur, and they are, tend to be linear and unambitious and conform, uh, typified by the homogenous middle. We think that actually there's value in bringing the principles of disruption board into the legal sphere. I would very much like to design and work with the uh, future law uh, team to say, how can we bring this into reality? How do we bring the power of radical outside expert thinking? So we have diversity of thought. How do we stretch ambitions? How do we bring in those lateral inputs for unexpected results? So we get heterogeneous and exponential type thinking as opposed to just doing the same thing again and again. So we've mapped out a bit of a process around how we can actually deliver that um, in conjunction. Um, new principles, new ways of working that embrace that radical thinking. Hey ben, do you want to just quickly just finish off around the lateral and the longitudinal um, ways that sure. we might consider approaching it? So, yeah, so in our experience, bringing um, from a disruption perspective, it's important to bring um, three different dimensions of uh, actors into that mix. So the first is the longitudinal, those are your typical um, sequential actors in a, in a value chain in the business sense. Clearly, there's a similar, there's a similar analog in, in the legal sector in terms of a, a start, a middle part, and an ending. So it's critical that those end-to-end -end considerations are brought into there. The uh, additional two are, are slightly more interesting. The latitudinal ones are looking at adjacency. So um, things we can learn from categories that have analogous kinds of approaches or might have similar system related um, procedures and processes that we can learn and incorporate. Uh, and that allows us to take that first step of looking outside of our own purview and embracing and engaging with, uh, with actors that can, that can provide us with a different perspective on the same sorts of challenges. And critically, the third part, we talked around this already, the lateral contributors are your free radicals, your breakthrough thinkers. In the past, we've used people from as diverse as uh, military commanders and uh, musicians into our into our innovation sets that sound at first glance completely ludicrous and ridiculous because they have no bearing and no direct correlation in terms of their interest or experience of what we're studying but by having been unencumbered by um, a, a category or a phenomenon it, it allows a freedom of, um, of, of risk taking of imagination of creative leaps that can often have a really profound effect 
So to wrap up, um, on Monday, we'll be holding a disruption seminar, a little taster example, um, where we will start to explore how a board dedicated to legal systems change can transform this sector. And it's about uh, um, adapting, um, adopting, absorbing some of the disruptive principles. And uh, there'll be a 90 minute session. Um, we're gonna demonstrate some of the exercises we have used to develop and deliver that with a disruptive mindset. And we'd encourage um, applications and interest. Uh, there'll be a, a, a very tight guest list invited for that. Um, and we hope that will be a very interactive and, and engaging session and give you a real flavor for not just the theory around this, but the practical application of how we translate uh, disruption into really meaningful and powerful ways forward to, to really revolutionize uh, categories and businesses. And I think just finally to uh, wrap up, I think that as the um, lead negotiators uh, and these communities of practices are developed, we, we can work with those individuals, teams, communities to put in place some of these principles about how do we uh, you know, go beyond what is possible, stretch, break the rules, um, bend the rules, lawyers don't like breaking the walls, but bend the walls to such points where the elastic snaps um, a little bit, then I think, you know, we'd love to explore that and see how we create models that actually take us to a very different place using the principles we've set out in this short presentation. So um, I think that's it from us, isn't it, Ben? I think we've short for Q&A, but um, that wasn't on purpose. <laughs> I think it was on purpose. It was on purpose. No, not really, but no, thanks so much, Scott and Ben um, for that presentation, because it really puts into context, um, you know, the relationship that we are forging with you to help us do the work that we are doing. Um, and so at Future Law, we have the meta-legal interdisciplinary approach that we were trying to foster, which I think aligns so well with this lateral and longitudinal approaches to bringing the diverse perspectives in. Um, I have not seen any questions written in the chat and we've run out of the Q&A time, but we're really excited about the session on Monday evening where we hope to uh, have this, we go through the exercises on this and uh, probably make an announcement um, by Friday coming out of the work, not Friday, Tuesday, coming out of the work that we do together on Monday um, from the lead negotiators who attend that meeting and who we're especially inviting to attend that meeting. So um, unless there are questions directly in the room, are there any questions directly in the room? And we're not seeing any on this side. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank you, Scott and Ben, for giving us that taster into disruptive innovation for the legal sector, which I just want to say that's it's very difficult because path dependence and precedent and story decisis and is what is required for parties to have certainty in terms of how we relate with each other. So it, it is the sector to test and experiment um, this on because it's, the hard, it's one of the toughest, if not the toughest. Yeah. We love to run towards those intractable, wicked problems. So, um, you know, let's have fun dancing in the dark. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you very much. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy and stick along with, for any of the sessions that you want to. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much. Okay. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, guys.